A Lie That Ruined Lives by Mick Daniels. All rights reserved January 11th, 2022. Page one. Mick, Pat and Kevin were friends since the day they started school together. Although they had never met before that morning, they walked in there together shoulder to shoulder under the beady eyes of the other pupils who were trying to size up what these three new fellas were made of. The fact there was three of them was good. They looked out for each other. The tough guys were less likely to take on three rather than one. A bond was formed between them that day that lasted throughout their school days and beyond. They started playing music together when they joined the school Cayley band. Pat played guitar because he got it for nothing off his older brother. Kevin played the fiddle, which was a present from his aunt. And Mick played a button box that he inherited off his grandfather. It wasn't long before the lads realised that if they started busking downtown, they could make some nice money. That is exactly what they did. And by the time they were 16, they were making nearly as much money busking as they were working. Mick was serving his time as a painter. Pat and Kevin were working in the glass factory. By the time they were 18, they were playing four gigs a week. They were making serious money and having brilliant crack at the same time. They stayed back after the closing in the pubs where they played in. They got off with the women. Yep. Life was good for the Black Rock Cayley Band in 1979. Sergio Leone was the manager of a new up-and-coming music pub recently bought by a rich fella called Jeff McCarthy, who came home from Australia. McCarthy had told Sergio, in no uncertain terms, he wanted the Black Rock Cayley Band playing at the launch of his new lounge on Paddy's Day come hell or high water. Sergio bumped into Mick on the street on Stephen's day. Jesus, Mick, boy, he said, just the man I was looking for. I want a bookie for Paddy's day to play in McCarthy's new music lounge. <laughs> Sorry, Sergio said, Mick, you're a bit late, boy. We're already booked up for, for Morphe's since, since last year. Sergio said, whatever Morphe is paying, I will double it. Mick nearly collapsed in the shock. He said he'd have to talk to the lads about it. When Mick met the lads that night, they were flabbergasted when they heard of Sergio's offer. Murphy had been paying them 300 for the Paddy's Day gigs for the past two years. Decent enough money. Pat said, for fuck's sake, this is 600 quid Sergio was offering for the day. How can we turn it down? Mick got back to Sergio the next day. He said 600 and we have a deal. Sergio said, no blobs, well done. Talk soon, my friend. Bye bye. When Sergio put down the phone, he jumped in the air. <laughs> Punch skywards. He had just made himself the handiest 400 quid ever. When Sergio had reported back to his boss that the band were thinking about his offer, to double whatever Murphy was paying, McCarthy just said, offer them a thousand quid. Paddy's day came and went. McCarthy's new lounge bar and beer garden were packed to the rafters all day and all night. At the end of the night, Sergio handed Mick a brown envelope with 600 in it. Mick immediately split it into three 200s, handed Kevin his 200, and Pat is 200. Everybody was happy, job done, how bad? Kevin was sick as a pig the following day, but he had to go to the bank to get the traveller's checks for their Spanish holiday. Jeff McCarthy was in front of him in the queue at the bank. Jeff, the owner of the Short Arse Tavern said, fair play to you, that was some session you put on yesterday. And worth every penny of the fucking thousand I gave you for it. Well done to you. He 
he'd swagger towards the counter, waving his wads of cash. Kevin nearly went through the floor. A thousand quid? What the fucking fuck like? His mind was in overdrive. He didn't know what to do. Would he call the three of them together? Just leave his cards on the table, say what McCarthy told him in the bank. There was never a question or a suspicion of any kind between the three of them when it came to money. For fuck's sake, it could often have been any one of them who would collect the money after gigs and split it. Mind you, in recent years, it was mainly Mick who looked after the money. He was going nuts over it. He couldn't stop thinking about it. Was Mick screwing them all along? If so, how much? Or was maybe the Paddy's Day thing was just a once off? He decided to wait until Tuesday. He would be playing the weekly session at Murphy's and he'd bring it up then. That session never happened. Murphy had dropped in a note with Kevin's mother saying he was cancelling the Tuesday sessions. Murphy also said, you weren't long about forgetting the people who got you up and going in this town in the first place with your regular sessions. Two weeks went by. Kevin was up the wall at this stage. His mind was racing in all directions. Was Pat in on it as well? Now he could trust nobody. Kevin was never that great with money anyway. He just spent it as quick as he could get it. Drink, clothes, women, cars, holidays, smokes, whatever. They were easily the most popular band in the locality at that stage. They were doing two gigs a week in McCarthy's Lounge now at 7.50 a pop. And they were starting to get gigs in Dublin and Cork that were paying a thousand, twelve hundred. If he stirred shit, he might fuck up the whole thing on everyone. He decided he'd keep a closer eye on the other two, and on Mick in particular. He was broken hearted over the Mick team. They were always great pals, and his younger sister Concepta had the hots for Mick in a big way, and the feeling was mutual. Things were never really the same again between the three of them after the Paddy's Day thing. Kevin and Pat kind of stuck together a bit more. Mick started getting squeezed out a bit, especially when it came to collecting money after gigs. Kevin also had a new girlfriend called Lucinda. She was absolutely drop-dead gorgeous and an unbelievable guitar player and singer. It was Lucinda who suggested a change in direction of the band. The trad music scene was kind of going downhill a bit. There was only limited enough audience. Lucinda had a mate called Tanya, who was, I'm telling you, I kid you not, she was sex on legs, unbelievable, and a brilliant drummer. Everybody was using backing tracks now anyway. The two men, Kevin and Pat, and the two women, Lucinda and Tanya, looked well together on stage. It was decided that a new band called The Symbolics would be launched under a new management agency. Pat changed to an electric guitar, a Fender Stratocaster, no less. Kevin changed to an electric fiddle. They were getting popular with bands like Steel Ice Band at that time anyway. There was no place in the new band for Mick. Neither Kevin nor Pat had the courage to go and see Mick and tell him the bad news. Instead, they wrote a note to him. Kevin posted it through the letterbox in Mick's place and then ran, ran away. The note read, Dear Mick, we are starting a new band and we will not be using a box player. Yours sincerely, Kevin Nash, Patrick O'Leary. It was eight years before Mick laid eyes on either of them again. Mick was busking in Red Square, Waterford, Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. Pat and Kevin came swaggering around the corner with their two Barbies in tow. It was a bit of a shock for the three lads mainly. The two women swaggered on singing words like, catch you later. It was awkward. None of them knew what to say. None of them knew where to look. 
Mick had a battery operator, a little woman playing a bower on, sitting on a three legged stool in front of him. Kevin pointed at the little woman playing the bower on and said, Would you not give the poor woman a drop of porter? She looks fairly parched there. There was a pause. Mick burst into laughter, followed by the others. The air was lightened. They had smiles on their faces. Pat said, what about we go and have a jar outside T and H's right now? Without another word, three men and a battery operated woman perched themselves outside the historical establishment known as T and H Doolan's Wine Merchants. Three pints of Guinness were ordered. There was silence between them. The only sound was the sound of life passing them by. Kevin stood up and shouted at Mick. Why did you take the thousand on Paddy's day and tell us it was only six hundred? Why did you fucking do that, Mick? Mick nearly exploded off the chair. I got the six fucking hundred we agreed on, Sergio. I splitted it with you. Now what the fuck are you talking about a thousand for? Kevin told Mick of his chance encounter with Jeff McCarthy at the bank and how McCarthy had said we were really worth the thousand he gave us. There was silence. Pat said, oh holy fuck lads. Sergio got the thousand off McCarthy but he only gave Mick 600. We were all codded by Sergio, the little bollocks. <coughs> Okay, we're testing here. <clears throat> this is a lie that ruined lives. Again, there was silence, broken only by, same again, gents, from the barman. Mick nodded and said, yes, please, we will have three pints of your best, my good man. Mick asked Kevin, how is Concepta getting on? Ah, oh, jeez, poor Concepta. Not great again nowadays. She's back using. We, we just don't know what's going to become of her. Mick asked, does she still play the concertina? Kevin said, nah. She want me to kick you when you left the band. Um, and she stopped getting the lessons from you. She just, she just lost the interest. And she fucking sold it to get money for drugs in the end. He was broken hearted when he heard Concepta's story. He had always felt that if things had not turned bad on him and with the band, and he and Concepta would have ended up together. She would have ended up playing the concertina in the band. Kevin asked Mick, what do you do with yourself these days? Mick said, I'm a delivery driver for an organic farm where I also volunteer. I do a bit of busking, I do a bit of painting. I'm with a lovely woman. We have a four-year-old little girl, two-year-old little boy. Life has never been better for me. Mick asks Kevin, how about you? We have an apartment beside the park. I'm still driving the taxi since the factory closed down. We will never be having any kids. I so, so envy you for that, Mick. The band is dying to death. Lucinda thinks we should go to London. I'm, I don't know how it's all going to play out. Mick asks Pat, what are you up to nowadays? Since I broke up with the missus, uh, I, I, I live in a flat in Barrack Street. I don't think the band is going to last much longer. I still do the TV, electronic repairs, equipment, turned with events, that, that kind of thing, you know. You know how that goes. I love a bit of fishing, though. Again, there was silence. 
the enormity of it was sinking into the three of them. Their lives could have been so much better except for that fucking lie from Sergio, the little bollocks. Each of the three men stood, placed their hands on each other's shoulders. They touched heads looking at the floor. The first tears were from Kevin. No sobbing, just the sound of his tears hitting the floor. Very quickly there were two more sets of tears hitting the floor. It lasted a couple of minutes before Kevin said, very quickly there were two more sets of tears hitting the floor. It lasted a couple of minutes. Then Kevin said, Nick, we ended up hating you, boy. We kicked you out of the band. We cut you off from everything. And all because we thought you were a fucking robber. But it turns out you never robbed us of a fucking thing. The whole fucking shit show was caused by a fucking lie about a lousy 400 fucking pound. The happy ending. Six months later to the day, the three men were standing together again at their reunion gig. The Black Rock Cayley band were on stage at the Short Arse Harvard again for the first time in nine years. There was a new manager there since Sergio's unfortunate accident six months previously. 